Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Flo. I'm uh, the, uh, the Corporate Innovation Manager for the US branch of uh, True Spirits Region. Uh, so I will be your uh, host today uh, for our tech meeting dedicated to hydrogen. Uh, so we're going to uh, start the event. Uh, so this session will be recorded. So please let me know if anyone would be against it. Uh, great. So I'm going to present you the agenda for today. Uh, so after a short introduction of what we do, I'll provide some, uh, some key figures uh, about the hydrogen industry. Uh, then Sevinch uh, from uh, True Spirits Region as an energy and clean tech expert uh, will provide an expertise on the, uh, the initiatives in the Paris region. Uh, so then we will move to the fireside chat with our experts today, uh, Benoit Genin, Stéphane Cabat and uh, Cameron Martin. Uh, to discuss the, uh, the, uh, the industry and tomorrow's big trend of innovation. Uh, and then we will finish this event with a selection of uh, innovative companies presenting their solutions and products. Uh, so we will answer uh, questions at the end of the uh, fireside chat uh, if you have any to our experts. Uh, so feel free to use the, the question feature uh, of Lightstorm if you, uh, you want to ask a question. Um, great, so let's uh, let's jump uh, into it with a short presentation of uh, True Spirits Region uh, and what we do. Uh, so for uh, for some of you who, uh, who don't know us, True Spirits Region is a catalyst for business and innovation. We uh, partner with Fortune 500 corporations in order to uh, support uh, international companies willing to expand their and, and set up business in the Paris region. Uh, so thanks to our presence uh, in uh, um, and, and vibrant tech ecosystem uh, located in San Francisco, New York, uh, Beijing, uh, Shanghai, and of course, Paris. Uh, we are in touch with over 4,000 uh, international companies every year. Uh, so this, this unique relationship uh, between large corporations on one hand and with innovative, first, fast growing companies on the other hand, uh, led us to create the, the Global Open Innovation Network about five years ago. Uh, and so through this, uh, this global program, uh, we organize about 20 events a year uh, to foster business uh, and technology partnerships between uh, large corporations and startups. Uh, so since the pandemic moved our events online, uh, it allowed us to, uh, to connect and get in touch with, uh, with more people, more companies. Uh, so it, it has been a pretty interesting experience. Uh, of course, we're going to start uh, our uh, physical events uh, again this year, so I'm, uh, I'm very uh, thrilled by this. Um, great, so we, uh, we, care, we, 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 uh, we cover a narrow of technologies, so as you can see here, uh, it's mobility, AI, retail, health, uh, and, and you name it. Uh, so uh, today we are going to talk about hydrogen. So first, uh, I wanted to, uh, to show you um, a brief overview of the, the hydrogen industry. Uh, of course, it's, it's composed of, of different actors from, from various industries. Uh, so you can see here the big names, Air Liquide, Messer, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we can also find a lot of actors uh, in, in different sectors like transportation or construction. Uh, and so we'll, uh, we'll actually have some, uh, some great example during the, the, start, the startup presentation and, and the panel. Um, so here are the, the, the key figures I wanted to, uh, to share today. I wanted to, uh, to stop on three main figures really quickly uh, to, uh, to set up the base uh, of our discussion with the panel. Uh, so uh, the, the first one today, uh, very important, the, the global hydrogen genera generation market size uh, is, um, is valued around $121 billion uh, based on a PWC report. Um, so something important as well is that by 2050, uh, so hydrogen could be accounted for 20% uh, of, the, of the world's final demand uh, energy elements. Um, so it, it shows that H2 is, is one of the major uh, energy uh, sources uh, for, uh, for, for, for the next like 10, 15 and, and 20 years. Um, the last thing I wanted to, uh, to show is that in, in 2021, uh, the market demand for uh, for hydrogen was around 99 million metric tons, uh, and is it's it expected to uh, to reach 204 uh, million metric tons in 2030. Um, 
so we, we can see the, the main predictions here uh, and they will raise over and over in the, in the coming years based on, on other industries uh, transitioning their, their solution or, or product, for example, to hydrogen. Uh, so those trends and industries where hydrogen uh, is a prominent source of energy, uh, as we can see here, are like the manufacturing industry, the transport, of course, with planes, cars, trains, etc., uh, building construction, and, and power generation. Uh, to finish this uh, this overview of the hydrogen industry, I wanted to uh, to share this uh, this not exhaustive market map. Um, so we we designed it based on on different players we have identified on the market. Uh, it's it's missing a few actors, of course, but it gives us a good uh, a good understanding on what is happening these days. Um, so I don't want to get into too much details. Uh, if you're interested or have a question, feel free to reach out to me. I'll be glad to, uh, to share it with you, tell you how I built it, etc. cetera. Um, great, so before, uh, before we get to, discuss, to, the, to the discussion with the panel, uh, I wanted to, uh, to invite Savinch uh, on stage with me so she can, uh, she can talk about the, the different initiatives uh, for hydrogen in the Paris region. Um, so Savinch, if you can uh, join me on stage. Hi, Savinch, how are you doing? Hello, I'm fine, thank you. And thank you very much, Flo, for inviting me. So uh, I'm gonna share my screen, yes, quickly. So you, you already introduced myself, uh, this is perfect. And I'm the ClinTech expert at Choose Forest Region and I'm very happy to be here with you. So it's gonna be a very, very short presentation. Uh, I just have two minutes to, to speak about hydrogen in Paris region and hydrogen in France. So as you may know, France has announced its plans to ramp up its production of green hydrogen to 40 gigawatt by 2013 to reach the target of carbon neutrality uh, in all industry with several uh, billion euro of investment and territorial support and R&D program. So yes, indeed, uh, green hydrogen today in France is seen as a pivotal energy source to bridge the gap of hard to decarbonize sectors such as transportation industry and heavy industry. So here in Paris region, are, uh, we have two main objectives and I'm going to explain you why. Uh, the first one is to encourage the production of renewable and carbon neutral hydrogen. Uh, and the second one will be to reduce emission and support innovation on the road, uh, mainly. And uh, why on the road? It's very interesting because we have uh, 12 million of habitants, inhabitants and we have more than 40 million of trips uh, per day. And uh, road transport mobility is one of the major um, carbon emission here in Paris region. And uh, road seems to be the most uh, easiest, uh, fastest way to promote and to, to develop the hydrogen here in Paris region. And you see that we're gonna have three phases uh, here in Paris region, 2020 and activation phases, 2025 and acceleration phases, thanks to the Olympic games, and uh, 2030 to 2050, a massification phase. So uh, in, this is, uh, these are the main key figures or ambitions uh, in terms of roads, in terms of um, production and in terms of stations. So to give you an opportunity of what we do and uh, where we will be today. Um, so, so yeah. sorry, can you, uh, sorry, it's a question in the chat. Can you? Uh, I don't see the question. Uh, can, can you possibly remove the uh, the bar at the bottom so uh, so so we can see every, okay. like on the screen if you if you can? Sorry for that. Oh yeah, no problem. Uh, so this was uh, this was the ambition maps of Paris region with the number of uh, vehicles, with the number of stations, and with the capacity production that we target. And uh, we believe that the Olympic Games will be an acceleration uh, for Paris region. 
So currently what we have, uh, it's written 12 in 2020. Last year in 2021, we were um, most about more than 20 projects. Most of the, uh, this is only the uh, visible part uh, of the iceberg and you have all the hidden park, which are currently in the hand of the states and asking for supports and fundings. So to give you a few examples of what is going on, uh, so I just wanted to speak about the um, hype project between 2015 and 24, uh, 2014. They aim to have a, a fleet of vehicles uh, for the Olympic Games, which is impressive. They announced 10,000 vehicles by 2024. So for all these vehicles, we will need stations. Uh, another thing that we try to implement is to generate hydrogen thanks to the uh, waste pro incineration. incineration. So the, the, the production of uh, this hydrogen will uh, alimentate the buses and the transportation and uh, uh, of one city of Paris region. And uh, the last my project, which is Accio behind, it's um, to implement more that uh, to, to implement a, a lot of station by 2024 for the Paris Olympic Games. And that's it uh, for me, Florian. I hope I give you a, a little understanding, a little summary of what is going on in Paris region about hydrogen. Yes, thank you so much, Shavinj, uh, for uh, I will be here at the end, so do yes. not hesitate. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, we're going to move on uh, with our uh, panel and the discussion today. Uh, so I'm going to uh, invite our three speakers today. Um, so it's uh, Benoit Genin, uh, Stéphane Cabat, and, uh, um, and Cameron Martin. So we're just going to wait a few seconds so they can join us. There we go. Hello, Benoit, how are you doing? Hey, I'm fine. Thank you. Uh, can you see me, actually? Uh, I cannot see you yet, no. And do I have to do something for that? Let me have a check. Hi, Cam. How are you doing? Oh, I can I cannot hear you, Cam. I think I think you're on mute, maybe. And we're just going to wait for uh, Stefan. Yes. OK, Cam, can we hear? Is the mic working? OK, Benoit, perfect. I think it's good now. OK, perfect. Uh, Cam, I'm not sure I can hear you, unfortunately. Great, we're just going to wait for Stefan and then we're going to start. All right. Maybe uh, while we uh, we wait for Stefan, uh, maybe we can uh, we can start. Um, so thank you, thank you for uh, accepting my uh, invitation. Uh, I'm I'm very excited to uh, to have you today. Um, so maybe first we can uh, we can start with uh, uh, a little presentation uh, of uh, of all of you. Uh, so maybe yeah, you could uh, you could present yourself, tell us a little bit about you, the uh, the organization you're uh, representing. And uh, and your uh, current project. Uh, so maybe, yeah, maybe Benoit, you want to start? Yeah, sure. So uh, nice to meet you all. Good uh, morning, good evening. Uh, so indeed, I'm Benoit Gena. Um, I'm currently a business developer within uh, NG in the in the Green Edge Two uh, business unit. I've been working for NG for a bit more than fifteen years now, mainly in uh, trading and portfolio management uh, field. Uh, I've been located in uh, in Brussels and Paris and uh, and also in Santiago in Chile. Um, I actually came back in uh, in Brussels uh, one year ago, uh, where uh, I am now a business developer so for Green Edge Two Solutions. 
Um, I have a specific focus for a steel project, but not only, also a refinery. So we are going to discuss about a project in Masilia, for instance. So, um, so steel, refinery, but also mines. So maybe two words indeed for uh, for uh, for NG in the field of uh, of hydrogen. So very strong ambition with with uh, NG. We've got a 600 megawatt target by 2025, which is actually tomorrow and huh, 2025 for this kind of project. A four gigawatts by 2030, and we are currently developing more or less 70 projects with a different stage of uh, of maturity, of course. Uh, one. One being already under construction in uh, in South Africa uh, to produce some uh, green hydrogen for uh, truck mines uh, with Anglo American, but uh, we also have some some pretty important project uh, with uh, subsidies already secured in uh, in Australia uh, for green ammonia and also in Chile. So huge ambitions, uh, uh, a lot of projects already under uh, ongoing. Uh, so, uh, so extremely happy to be with you today. Uh, I think it's a very nice topic. So, uh, extremely excited to, uh, to to get that, to get this with uh, with you guys uh, today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Benoit. Uh, it's a pleasure to to have you as well. Um, yeah, great, uh, Cam. Uh, if if your uh, if your mic is working, <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. It's not working yet. Um, so I'm not sure why. Uh, so maybe maybe Stefan first. Um, if you want to present yourself, a little bit about your company and, uh, and projects. Okay, so thank you, thank you very much. I don't know if you hear me because uh, I'm uh, on a vacation and the place where I am is very bad in terms of connection. So I, I hope it works uh, quite well. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can hear. Okay, you. okay, okay, very good. So, so my name yes, is Stéphane Cabin. Um, I work for the company Alstom, Alstom Transport. So I did join the company 20, 23 years ago. Um, I'm based in uh, the head office in saint ouen uh, in, uh, in the Paris region, and um, I have two, two, two roles in the company. The first one uh, started quite a long time ago uh, for the very high-speed train, which is not the topic of today. And uh, the second one is related to, um, to, to what we call the green and smart mobility, which uh, started uh, quite uh, recently. Uh, so I have been uh, appointed to be responsible for, for, for hydrogen uh, uh, trains. Uh, because we are uh, pushing quite a lot uh, about uh, H2 technology uh, for the rail activities. Um, so I'm very pleased anyway to be to be attending this uh, this meeting uh, with you, uh, with a startup coming from the US, because uh, we do believe that there is some potential activities for us and for um, a, a railway application uh, uh, on different markets. So Europe, uh, yes, for sure, but also in the American market uh, for the passenger trains, but also for the freight uh, trains. Um, Alstom uh, started uh, quite a long time ago uh, to think about hydrogen uh, because uh, uh, green, uh, greening the mobility, the heavy duty mobility uh, has been a priority set by the top management of the company uh, in uh, 2014. Uh, we started to think about it and we decided to launch the first two trains um, in 2018 in Germany. So it was Germany because uh, there was some uh, very strong uh, willingness from the, from the German government to, um, to push uh, those uh, green solutions uh, throughout uh, the German network. And um, we had the chance uh, through a very strong cooperation between uh, France, uh, because uh, we as term, we have some uh, competencies uh, in France, uh, in the south of France, in Tarbes, uh, in the head office in saint ouen close to Paris as well with some uh, people uh, knowing quite well what to do in terms of uh, greening mobility and uh, Germany as well, because we have um, a huge fleet, a great fleet of trains um, delivered and uh, in operation today uh, with diesel. So diesel is not very good today. There is from uh, many countries, especially in Germany, some diesel ban ongoing today. And we had to think about some new solutions. So hydrogen has been very clearly targeted and in 2018 we reached a very big breakthrough since we were the first company in the world to have those two trains in operation in commercial operation it was not prototype but it was commercial operation with trains 100 percent hydrogen with um, performances 
similar to what we are doing today uh, or what we did in the past with diesel train. Autonomy, 1,000 kilometers, speed, 140 kph, um, capacity, 150 people inside, uh, and uh, also some improvements comparing to diesel because uh, one of the big advantage of hydrogen is to have some uh, very silent train. There is no noise at all, so the level of comfort has been increased. So all of this is not uh, the end of the story because uh, we have, and I will discuss, we will have a chance to discuss about it a bit later, but uh, we have uh, a failure route, as we say in French, um, to um, improve uh, what we have started to do in 2018, uh, both for passengers' train, but also for the freight application. But maybe um, I can uh, leave uh, the mic to Cam, and I will come back to you um, to discuss a bit more details about uh, what we want to do later. Yeah, definitely, definitely. We're gonna we're gonna touch on those, yeah. those subjects. Cam, sure. uh, I hope your your mic works. No, it doesn't work, unfortunately. Maybe maybe check in the settings uh, and uh, to see if you can uh, you can find something. Um, Florian, do, 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 yes. do you also have a, a small noise in, in the, yeah? I do, yeah, I'm not sure what it's, what it's okay. going for me. Yeah. But uh, at least I'm not the only one. Yeah, no, okay, no. that's yeah, fine. Yeah, it's better now. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, that was, that was from Cam, so I believe Cam has like a, a mic that is like maybe plugged uh, uh, wrongly because the, uh, the the noise was coming from there. Uh, so Cam, maybe we're going to take you in the in the back room and, and see if we can, uh, uh, if we can find a solution, okay? All right, so we're going to, we're going to start uh, with you too. Uh, in the meantime, so um, we can we can start the discussion. Uh, first question I had actually about a general hydrogen uh, overview uh, of the uh, of the industry. I wanted to uh, uh, to know like your 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 point of view on something. Um, hydrogen is a is a very trendy topic uh, at the moment, of course. Everyone is talking about it, uh, and and it seems to be very important uh, for something, and that that's why everyone is talking about it. It's for the uh, the climate, of course. Um, so I wanted to uh, to ask you first, like why and and how hydrogen is is first is is different from other energy sources, and and why is everyone is is talking about it, uh, like regarding the the the, the climate change. Um, Benoit, yeah, you want to go first, maybe? Yeah, sure. So, uh, so within NG, we are extremely bullish with uh, with hydrogen. So uh, I I already mentioned our target uh, uh, of four gigawatt by 2030. Why it is green? It's just that you are producing now hydrogen. So we we believe on the green hydrogen. So maybe just to explain how it works, you are producing some uh, some green power uh, via renewable, wind or solar. And then you are using water plus electrolysis, and then you can produce green hydrogen. So by producing green hydrogen, you are not emitting one single uh, ton of CO2. So it's a fully green solution in order to uh, then use this hydrogen for industrial application or mobility application. So why it's better than other solution? It's just that it is absolutely CO2 free. Um, that's the first point. Um, our view within NG, once again, it's uh, we believe that it's clearly the future, uh, especially for very uh, big usage such as steel, um, but uh, not only refinery, mines, so for very big industrial players because they need uh, hydrogen. Some of them already use hydrogen actually as a feedstock. So, uh, but they are producing hydrogen through uh, gas natural uh, uh, commodity. So uh, the first step would be to greenify this production of hydrogen. And then we think that which is really important is to create some hubs. So starting with very big industrial player, big off taker, and then developing some uh, mobility solution. And here is a link with uh, Astom, for instance. So, uh, so in a nutshell, extremely bullish for this solution. It's fully green and starting with big off taker and then trying to spread the, the hydrogen to other type of uh, usages. Okay. Yeah. Stefan, you wanted to, uh, to add something? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so just to, um, to, I fully agree with what, uh, what Benoit said just before, but, uh, um, uh, I wanted to highlight some, uh, some uh, key features, you know, for the mobility because, uh, 
Mobility is a big, uh, is a big issue today in terms of uh, CO2 emission. Mobility globally. Uh, you know, the road, the road uh, transportation is uh, contributing quite a lot for the CO2 emission today. Um, and we are, uh, we as a railway uh, uh, um, uh, stakeholder, uh, we are pushing quite a lot uh, to get some uh, green solutions and to favor, to promote some what we call the modal shift, uh, because it is very important today to try to push uh, some transfer from roads application, so tracks, uh, cars, um, uh, to, to the rail, both for passengers and also for the freight application. Uh, it is a uh, much better in terms of contribution and in terms of uh, uh, targeting the objective of uh, uh, neutral uh, uh, CO2 emission by 2050. So it was the first uh, statement we did. Uh, so in 2014, when we started to think and to believe in, uh, in H2. But uh, first of all, um, uh, H2 uh, did not um, uh, arrive uh, by itself uh, because uh, uh, the first, uh, the, the second point beyond uh, beyond this uh, this uh, need to, to 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 have a model shift from uh, polluting road solutions to the to the green uh, road solutions. Um, beyond this, um, uh, there was also uh, the issue in terms of uh, rail application directly uh, for the rail uh, in Europe, uh, in, and it is also the case in France. You have roughly 50% of uh, the network which is um, uh, not electrified. Uh, so it means uh, quite a lot of trains, uh, and uh, it is a case in France, for example, you have more than 1,000 trains, regional trains today, in operation in France, um, uh, 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 that need to have some uh, autonomy uh, to be able to be operated on those non-electrified lines, and uh, this uh, autonomy is today provided by diesel uh, solutions. So to replace this, uh, for the 1,000 uh, uh, trains in France, but it is much uh, above. Uh, we are talking about 6,000 regional trains all across Europe. Um, and to be able to provide as well some autonomy to the freight application, because a freight trains has to be operated from one point to another one without any uh, stops, without any uh, disruption. And to do that, uh, you know, when you have a harbor, for example, there is no uh, catenary, there is no electrification. So uh, in the past, uh, operators, or up to, up to day, uh, up to now, uh, operators are using diesel locomotive to go from point A to point B, uh, going uh, through 800 kilometers with 90%, uh, which is electrified, but the last miles, the last kilometers being not electrified, then they will use diesel train all along the route. So we said it is a nonsense, and that's the reason why we need to have, we need to find a solution which is green, totally green, and that can provide this autonomy needed for the, not elect the non electrified network. Maybe you could say, me, okay, but in this kind, uh, 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 please uh, electrify uh, those lines. But what you have to know is that the cost of electrification is very high. And in the rail application, when you have some catenary, when you have some electrification, it is when you have a huge amount of traffic. So if you take an example of a TGV train, for example, if you take the example of a, a suburban train or uh, some uh, metro uh, or tramway as well, uh, you have a lot of traffic. You have one train every five minutes, every 10 minutes, then you may justify the huge amount of investment to electrify the line. But when you have lower traffic, then it is not relevant uh, uh, on a pure uh, cost-effective solution. It is not relevant to electrify the line. And this is where the green solutions, such as hydrogen, is making sense, is relevant. Um, you, have as well, you have as well the battery, because uh, uh, you can hear every time, you know, but uh, you can also, you know, use the battery. But uh, again, battery is not against hydrogen. It is two um, specific objectives in terms of autonomy because you cannot perform 1,000 kilometers using battery on a regional train. Same with freight application. And this is where there is a, 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 a clear a, a, a area of, uh, of, uh, of relevance. Uh, for battery, it is below, for a regional train, below 100 kilometers. And you will need to use hydrogen trains above 100 uh, kilometers. 
So um, this is what we believe. We do both today within uh, Alstom, and hydrogen is making sense for long distance train where there is no uh, a huge amount of traffic, and the same for freight application, which is uh, all the time quite yeah. long distance solutions. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, Cam, you hear perfect uh, headphones in. Uh, we got it. So yeah, maybe you could uh, present yourself briefly, and so we can uh, we can move on to the to the conversation. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> ah, perfect. Um, so Cameron Martin, I'm from Westinghouse. Uh, I oversee the advanced reactors and engineering team here in our digital innovation department. And we are looking at projects that extend uh, revenue streams for nuclear power plants. And one of them, which is very exciting for us, is hydrogen. Um, hydrogen has tremendous opportunities, everybody else was saying, to decarbonize uh, heavy industry first and then go into transportation and other areas as we grow out the technology. Um, so we, from a Westinghouse perspective right now, we are looking at initiatives related to the integration of electrolysis into nuclear power plants. And that is both existing and future advanced reactors. So we're very excited about the opportunity, and we're also excited about the all the uh, involvement of industry to get this initiative moving. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, great. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So we were uh, we were talking about like why why hydrogen why is so important uh, in in the the climate change or the climate fight. Um, so very like maybe a stupid question, but for you guys um, with all those initiatives today and in like in the future, the near future, um, is it the end of fossil fuel? Tim, if you want to start? I would say it's the start to the end of fossil fuel. There's a tremendous amount of technology development and investment needed by government agencies to really drive out fossil fuels. But it is definitely the start to reducing CO2 emissions at existing facilities um, out there. For example, hydrogen in high volumes could help decarbonize petrochemical industry, steel industries, um, the very large users of gas and hydrogen. So I don't see it as the, uh, I, th I see what we're at today as the cusp of the start of removing fossil fuels. Um, and that won't just be hydrogen, it'll be ammonia, it'll be bio or uh, syn fuels. It's going to be a mix of technology and opportunities in the future. Okay, yeah. Uh, Benoit, do you want to add something here? Yeah? No, I fully agree with uh, what just said Cameron. I just would like to add maybe that there is a way to produce uh, hydrogen, which is called the blue hydrogen, where you are using natural gas, and then you are capturing this natural mm -hmm. gas to, to, to store it or to reuse it for uh, other usages. So as such, hydrogen is n will not most likely kill totally fossil, uh, fossil fuel. Uh, and indeed, the, the cliff to, to be uh, to, to be managed in order to replace all the coal and uh, and gas and uh, and oil. I think that we are really at the at the very beginning of the story. Uh, fully agree with that. And uh, sharing once again uh, the, the view of Cameron, meaning that uh, uh, the, the 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 hydrogen should should first decarbonize the hard to abate industries. Uh, ammonia, we and fully sharing the view of Cameron. The the two first ones should be ammonia and steel because they are already using a huge amount of uh, uh, hydrogen as a feedstock, and then once again spreading the this type of usages for uh, mobility. Yeah, definitely. And 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 actually talking about mobility, um, I, I wanted to to ask you, Stefan. Actually, you you're of course in mobility. I wanted to, to ask you how the transition uh, is, is, is happening and, and how, for example, like a, a company like Alstom, how is Alstom adapting, for example, into this, this low carbon hydrogen economy? Um, can, you, can you tell us about that? Like how no, is that could, could actually uh, transition? Yeah, that, that, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, but to answer the question, I think, I think there is two, two, two KPI, two, two parameters to be, to be uh, Set out. Uh, the first one is 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 um, a political aspect uh, because there is some politics uh, in such a, 
a decision and a way to move and to and to and to go you know to the to the to the uh, zero emission solution uh to move forward to move forward in the zero uh, uh, emission solutions and the other one is economics uh, because uh, uh today um uh, uh, there is some cost aspect uh, to be to be considered so if i come back to the politics um uh, uh, what i want to say is that uh, if there is a diesel ban uh, in one country uh, you know we heard about uh, some diesel ban in european countries uh, by 2030 by 2035 then this will be the end of the story and we have to adapt uh, so all the industry uh, will have to adapt and to and to change solution and to move forward those uh, green solutions so h2 is definitely a part of it uh, but it is not um, always uh, the case uh, you may have some countries you may have some regions without any uh, uh, diesel ban uh, so uh, this is where economics will will have a key uh, a role uh, in the making decision process um, and uh, you know we are uh, uh, um, uh, struggling quite a lot to 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 to, to develop uh, the solutions we started as i said before you know in 2018 um, we need to make some improvement uh, to make some improvement in terms of uh, um, uh, uh, volume uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, lifetime of the products uh, in terms of um, what we call more globally you know the total cost of ownership so tco aspect is absolutely um, uh, key uh, in the making decision process for operators because an operator uh, will not accept to pay more than what he was paying before, you know, for some diesel solution. And this is why we are, we are, we, we do believe that um, the ongoing process uh, with uh, uh, all the um, French uh, stakeholders, but also, you know, at the European Union level, uh, because, you know, there is all those big projects, uh, what we call uh, IPSAI project, uh, so the very important uh, project for the, for the European Union uh, ongoing today, that will be absolutely key to make sure that we will be able to scale up those developments, that will be able to um, uh, uh, improve the solutions and to deliver solutions uh, um, uh, as a response to, 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 to what the operating company is uh, expecting today. Right. Um, yeah, very, very interesting, actually. And, and the politics, like you, you, you mentioned the politics. Um, I, I wanted to, to ask like a, 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 like a high level questions. Uh, can, for example, like, uh, do you see like enough uh, initiatives or, um, you know, like institutions, government and the private sector working together? Uh, to try to get in that way and trying to find new solutions, new things. Um, what, what do you see on, on the industry level uh, in terms of this, this uh, industry, like hydrogen like sector? So in hydrogen sector, <clears throat> what I see is a global investment strategy. If I recall, it's somewhere around $70 billion earmarked for hydrogen technologies and in growth. And what I'm seeing happen quite a bit right now is collaboration between national labs and government agencies to help infuse cash and provide incentives for um, facilities to upgrade and use hydrogen. And a lot of the investment I'm seeing happening right now is really in three areas. And I think it touches everybody here a little bit. So I'm seeing a lot of investment in uh, the three main types of, uh, of, of hydrogen production, steam methane reformation with carbon capture as mentioned, low temperature electrolysis, which is splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen. And then there's high temperature electrolysis, which is emerging probably two to three years away still from scaling. And that one is really just splitting steam into hydrogen. And that's pretty adv advantageous for you know our industry as well because we for, we provide quite a bit of electricity and we produce high quality steam. So I see the industry right now in investments. Uh, the real barrier right now is, I think, a global strategy for governments to roll out uh, plans and incentives for uh, end users of hydrogen to be incentivized to to own this technology and move it forward. I think that's one of our big, big challenges right now. I see a lot of uh, private industry interest in this, and there's a lot of new innovations and startup companies also entering the market. So it's an exciting time for hydrogen. <laughs> yeah, it is. 
Yeah, yeah. Hello. yeah, if I may, Florian, so just coming back on the subsidies in the US, so there is one plan which has been already voted, which is called the Infrastructure Bill, mm -hmm. and it represents $8 billion to, to develop some hubs all over the US. So this one is already ongoing, and actually uh, the Department of Energy issued some, uh, some requests for information recently. So uh, this is the first big step, and then there is another one still not voted by the Senate, which is called the Build Back better act and if this one will be uh, and we guess that it would be uh, voted in, in the coming months it would be a subsidy of three dollars per kilogram so i don't know if you've got the order of magnitude but but three dollars per kilogram it's really huge and we believe that it make the uh, the green h2 or even blue h2 but especially the, the green h2 because three dollars of subsidy is only for green h2 uh, by the way we believe that it makes green H2 solution in the money in the US. And this is a unique position in the US to get this parity very quickly. So uh, at NG side, we are, we are extremely bullish for the US. We believe that this industry will pop up extremely quickly uh, since the PTC, the production tax credit, the three dollars would be automatic it's not a competition between projects, it would be automatic. And this is already the system which is in place for renewable development in the US. And it has extremely well uh, worked in the past years. So, so subsidies in the US, we really need to follow up this, uh, this situation very carefully because a big story is going on there. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, well, actually, like talking about those, those hubs, um, I, I wanted to, to ask you what we could actually expect from, from those energy hubs that we can see uh, in, in 2030 or like 2050, like what, what can we expect from it? Because we, we can see that it's um, like a lot of those hubs are like being developed uh, everywhere actually, you know, like in the Middle East, uh, in, in uh, South America, I mean, in, even in Europe, I mean, everywhere. Uh, so yeah, what can, what can we expect? Um, who, who knows the answer? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think. So, so what I would expect, and I'll start this right now, is um, it's just not a hub is just not going to be one facility or one location. A hub is going to be a network of both centralized and decentralized hydrogen production. So, when when we see the hubs moving forward, it'll be placing. Um, hydrogen production or electrolysis systems near the end user um, for some some facilities and then others will be producing from a nuclear power perspective at the site which we call centralized production and where i'm seeing the market or the hub starting to form is where we, in decentralized areas those will probably be kind of a low temperature technology or steam methane reformation technology when we're talking centralized near power plants that's where we're going to start talking and getting excited about high temperature electrolysis and some advantages of it in both efficiency and and cost so that's where i'm seeing the hubs go today and there's a lot of planning going on right now in the states to to, to engage the Department of Energy and kick off these larger scale programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, great, yeah, I wanted to, uh, to, uh, to move a little bit uh, and, and go to the, a little bit of detail because we, uh, we talked about like the different colors of hydrogen, of course. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you like, what are the, the ways I would say, or, or technologies today uh, that we have today to, uh, to produce cleaner, like hydrogen. Um, so maybe Benoit, yeah, at NG for sure. Like. Yeah, so, so we at NG, we believe first in green hydrogen. Uh, green, uh, it means that uh, with power delivered by uh, wind or solar project, this is our main focus. Uh, but it could be also low carbon. So uh, I don't really know what is the situation in the US, but in France, there is, uh, and in Europe more broadly, there is a, a let's say, a comeback of nuclear solution uh, in, in the past months. So uh, so we would be interested to get some, some power from renewable assets or from nuclear. And then the idea is to use some, uh, some PEM or alkaline uh, electrolyzer. I'm not, I'm not a technical expert, but basically it's, it's the two main technologies uh, available today to, to, to make the electrolysis. 
Uh, so, uh, so maybe just mention the fact that there is so many projects all over the world that uh, we could face some bottleneck in terms of uh, supplying this kind of technology. Uh, it's it's a pretty uh, very often now we are we are there is some announcement of gigawatt scale projects, so thousands of megawatt project, which is just huge. Uh, obviously, a part of them will not be done at the end of the day, but uh, but we have to face. Most likely, we are going to face some uh, some bottleneck in terms of uh, electrolyzer uh, supply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and we actually like talking about like green uh, hydrogen. We had a question uh, from from the audience um, around like the like what could be the the, the market demand uh, expectations uh, for uh, for for green li liquid H two. Uh, like within the, the 2030 time frame, do, do you have any idea on this? I don't have, uh, what could we say? So the question was specific, specific, specific for liquid hydrogen. So it's mm -hmm. more on, on, on transportation, I guess. What, what I ju just can give as, a, as just an order of magnitude, if you want to transform one steel plant from what we call blast furnace to, to, to produce steel, to a direct reduction iron, you you need just to move. So it's a, it's a uh, CO2 emitting project versus zero carbon project with the DRI. You need 500 megawatts of base load power at least, which is half a nuclear reactor. So my point here is just that if we really want to go full a green hydrogen or low carbon hydrogen, it will require a huge, huge amount of, of power, of additional power on top of what we already have today as a demand. So it was not answering the question because the question is more yeah. liquid, but it just gives you the order of magnitude of what we are talking about. Right. Uh, yeah, Stefan, you, you wanted to add something? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think anyway, um, uh, first of all, for the, for the color, uh, hydrogen color, we are, uh, we, we, as a provider of uh, mobility solution, ray mobility solution, we are quite uh, agnostic because uh, all our uh, rail uh, product we want to promote will be able to be operated with a green or gray or blue or yellow or whatever the color is uh, solution of uh, H2. So, so, so it is a fair statement. Even so, definitely, uh, we are uh, encouraging uh, uh, energy producers such as uh, NG to go to, 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 to the green hydrogen and to be able to, to, to refuel our trains with uh, such a green hydrogen. But we are totally agnostic for that. Um, now to come back to uh, liquid hydrogen, um, it is something very important for the mobility sector uh, because uh, one of the key topics will be autonomy of the train. And I'm thinking about uh, freight, uh, freight application, freight uh, trains. And you know, in the US market, US market is a huge market in terms of uh, freight application. Uh, you have uh, uh, very long uh, trains, uh, very uh, heavy uh, trains that need to have uh, uh, autonomy, uh, quite, uh, quite important. Um, and this is where uh, liquid hydrogen can play a key role to be able to develop some uh, freight solution uh, with a very, very long uh, uh, autonomy, which is higher than uh, gaseous solution at the 350 or 700 bars, uh, it will be a, 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 a better solution. So it is something uh, 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 in which we are uh, uh, very confident. We do believe that liquid hydrogen should be and would be a solution uh, at the end of the day for the mobility, for the heavy duty mobility solutions. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Um, great, yeah, we, we talked about um, production um, and if we go a little bit further in the, in the logistics chain, uh, sorry, like we, I just wanted to uh, to ask you about the uh, the storage because it's a big topic in the hydrogen. How to store hydrogen? Uh, is it dangerous to store it? Uh, how can can we like transport it? Uh, so what what's your thought on that, uh, Cam? Cam, for example, yeah. Um, hydrogen storage right now is an interesting fact. There is an interesting topic because there's ma many methods to store it. And the question is whether you liquefy it or not. And liquefaction is a very energy intense operation as well. Um, so from, an from a storage perspective, it could be used for many things. Not only can it be used as a holding ground, but it also becomes 
a method, if we look at a solid oxide or a fuel cell that's able to produce hydrogen, you could then reverse the process and you stored hydrogen to produce electricity during peak demand. So storage of hydrogen is always going to be kind of, I think, more of a political debate due to the um, where do you place a storage facility relative to industry or residential areas. Um, but there's been quite an amount of analysis done and investment to do it safely right now. So I see storage as a option in the future, um, more so for uh, reproducing electricity or providing peak demand at this uh, for for hydrogen at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Benoit, about like storage, transportation of, of hydrogen. No, look, I, I'm not a technical expert, so um, so. But what I can mention for green hydrogen, so uh, the, the idea is to produce uh, the hydrogen with renewable power. We know that there is some uh, intermittency with uh, renewable power, so we believe that uh, that having storage is key to produce a base load demand of hydrogen. Um, so being next to a salt cavern or being next to a, to an oil uh, wheel, uh, it's, it's really important to, uh, to get the ability at the end of the day to produce base load because a lot of application needs base load supply, uh, to get, uh, to get their process, uh, going on. So not, not a technical as, uh, expert on that, but storage is a key player on, uh, on, the, on the value chain, for sure. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Um, great, yes, yeah, so we, uh, we come to the end of the discussion. I just wanted to, uh, uh, to have a few uh, more questions. Um, just in terms of industry, I just wanted to know um, what kind of like the, uh, the different sectors, I would say. I know I mentioned in the introduction a few sectors where uh, hydrogen is booming, but I, I wanted to ask you, uh, where do you see uh, hydrogen uh, going going big or like the, the new markets or like new industries uh, where hydrogen could be developed or could be, you know, like have a huge investment um, for, for you guys, yeah. Um, Benoit, if you want to start again. Yeah, yeah. So, so best location. There's two main triggers. The first one is access to a cheap uh, renewable renewable power, or or low carbon power. Let's say so nu nuclear as well. So uh, this is absolutely key. And then countries where you already have some subsidies. So and that's why we believe that uh, US is is uh, is potentially a key country because we know that there is a, a cheap and uh, available renewable power, especially in, in Texas and, and, and California as well, actually. You already have some subsidies scheme in some states in the US, in California, for low fuel uh, uh, sales of fuel. Uh, and we are expecting some uh, additional uh, federal subsidy. So, uh, so US is, is, a key, is a key one. Uh, South America as well is potentially a key player. Uh, you've got some uh, some country like uh, Chile, where there is a lot of uh, uh, power um, solar and wind project, and they, they are already uh, signing some agreement to in order to export hydrogen to uh, to Europe, for instance. Middle East also is a clear uh, good region to produce uh, green uh, green hydrogen as well. So cheap renewable subsidy that is for the production side. And then more on the demand side. So we already mentioned about uh, steel, heavy mobility. So train, obviously, steel, ammonia, um, and then also uh, shipping and airliner. They will have some some restriction at one point of time to get to uh, to move from from kerosene or uh, or methane into a synthetic fuel. So uh, e, uh, e kerosene or or e methane, and for that they will need some hydrogen as well. So um, yeah, this is my um, my view on that. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, Stefan, maybe like a sector, a technology where like uh, investment is is going uh, quite quite big, like in the in the in the next few years or last years. Yeah, so I I do believe that uh, mobility is clearly uh, one of the key sectors targeted today. You know, by uh, by uh, all the. Um, uh, plan de relance, uh, you know, the, which is very strong today. Uh, there is 7 billion euros in France uh, to support, anyways, the hydrogen sector. 
uh, mobility is clearly is clearly targeted. Uh, why? Because uh, because uh, again, to come back to the CO2 emission uh, mobility today, uh, so all mobility uh, sectors uh, uh, included, this is one third of the CO2 emission, so more than 33 uh, percent. Then it is clearly targeted, and we do believe as well that, um, and this is uh, we are encouraged uh, by uh, uh, the public authorities, uh, by the European Union as well to have some synergies, uh, because uh, it is not, you know, to say that uh, the rail sector will develop uh, solutions uh, for the rail application only, and the same for the trucks, and the same for the maritime sector. Uh, what we are trying to do today is to try to um, mutualize uh, all the needs uh, between those various sectors. Uh, so mobility, again, is clearly a targeted sector, a booming sector for hydrogen. And I would uh, add um, also some uh, stationary um, uh, uh, solution, um, especially for the data center. Uh, there is a huge demand today, you know, to um, for the for the for the for the cooling of the data center, uh, using some solutions that could be uh, that could have some common uh, 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 definition, common design with what we want to develop as well for some of the specific mobility uh, 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 application. So this is where, uh, 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 according to my uh, understanding of the market today, uh, I can see a booming demand for hydrogen. Okay, makes sense. And Ken? Well, where I see hydrogen going is anytime you have significant investment like we have today driving into an industry, it's going to drive and create opportunities for innovation. And what we're seeing is you, we talk about steam methane reform, reformation, it's out there, PEM, alkaline technologies. It's also driving a next generation of electrolysis and high temperature electrolysis to split steam. And beyond that, there's other opportunities as well. So I see the market forming uh, quickly and then innovation picking up soon and a lot of new startups and a and that's just not with hydrogen, it's what hydrogen also enables, like ammonia production, um, sin fuels, uh, sin fuel to, to, to be used in airplanes. Um, so the future is really all about investment and innovation at this point of how we take what we have today and grow it into something amazing by 2050. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Uh, great, thank you so much. Uh, I, I had way more questions, but unfortunately the time is uh, is running. Uh, so thank you, thank you so much, uh, Benoit, uh, Cam, Stefan, uh, for your insight. Uh, thank you again for accepting my uh, my invitation. And uh, yeah, please stay with us for the for the second part of the uh, of the event. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Fabian. To you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, great. So we are going to uh, move on uh, with our event, and we're going to start the the startup presentation. And so I'm going to uh, call uh, John from uh, from Wine Scientific uh, on stage, so he can uh, present his uh, company. I'm just going to find him. Okay, John is not here anymore. I'm just gonna wait for him. Um, great. All right. So John is the uh, the CEO of uh, One Scientific, and so he's gonna present uh, his uh, his company now. I'm just gonna share the presentation. Hello, how you doing? I'm doing great. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Perfect, perfect. You can see me, you can hear me, should be yes. good to go. Wonderful. Uh, all right, I'm gonna try to start with sharing my screen. Yes. Uh, hold on just for one second. Oh. Share screen. One second. Yes, of course. Hmm. Screen. Just 
just let me know if it's working okay almost there just trying to maneuver a few <laughs> yeah, let's no see i believe of share mm -hmm. hey hey this is uh okay we got it yes perfect thank you uh the floor is yours and uh yeah you have five okay. minutes Okay, perfect. Yep. Sorry about the yeah you know, the few minutes there. Hey, um, hello everybody. I'm John Barnwell, co-founder and COO of One Scientific. It's nice to meet you all. Thank everyone for today's effort, the panelists, flow, and for the opportunity to share our work in helping to accelerate hydrogen. I would like to open up with a few points about One Scientific. Uh, we were founded in 2015 with a mission to make clean hydrogen or green hydrogen affordable and available worldwide. Think of us as doing a similar type of work in a similar, probably a similar type environment uh, to the early days of Apple before it became Apple. Um, interested in forming partnerships with companies that have experience in bringing early stage technologies to market. And now we are working to de-risk our process, which basically means repeatability of benchmark uh, test results. We know that the existing hydrogen supply chain is a trade-off between capital intensive centralized production and the high cost of delivered hydrogen. Uh, we built it to serve the needs of industries that look much different than, than the needs for energy storage for today. Um, but at the end of the day, the existing supply chain is both carbon heavy and costly. Uh, the U.S. Department of Energy identifies the gap between conventional hydrogen production and cost competitive, competitiveness with fossil fuel needs to be reduced by a factor of four. And that's been a huge challenge for all of us. The crown jewel of the industry is to develop a cost-effective on-site generation technology that is cost competitive with liquefied. This would in turn help us to maximize the use of capital, capture the high cost of distribution, as well as reduce the output of harmful air emissions. So we took a, at One Scientific, we took a thermal approach through our work, which has been more about a journey of discovery rather than invention. And we're still discovering. Uh, but in short, our work centers around the application of a magnetic field to a catalytic reaction uh, to produce hydrogen from 100% steam. Uh, we have several theories that involve magnetohydrodynamics, plasma generation, uh, cyclonic separation, but we'll want to save that for another discussion. Um, the important point here is the data indicates that this process is low cost and produces zero harmful byproducts. And by low cost, we're talking about the potential to save up to 75% on uh, on-site uh, production costs. Here we want to highlight that uh, the economics are lining up to be on par with large-scale SMR. Um, this process is, uh, the input is 100, again, 100% 100 steam. Um, it's OPEX driven rather than CAPEX. Uh, the system and the process is quite compact. It's modular, scalable, and therefore has applications across existing industries and emerging markets. Our, <clears throat> our role in the hydrogen value chain is that of a technology licensor. Think of us as a technology supplier. We intend to make money by licensing the IP rights and know-how to commercialization partners in exchange for fees and royalties. Being that the industry is large, fragmented with many end users across existing and emerging markets, we're looking for partners with commercialization resources and expertise needed to bring uh, new tech, this new technology to the market. If your company falls within this footprint, this type of footprint, please reach out. We would love to talk to you. To wrap up, we have a, an expert team in place. We have original IP that's disruptive, strong value proposition, a highly scalable process and model, 
and we have opportunities for joint development work. Thank you everybody for their time. I'm John Barnwell. Thank you so much, John, uh, for, uh, for the presentation. Very exciting uh, uh, solution. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, we're going to, uh, to move on uh, with uh, Sent. Uh, so I'm gonna invite you uh, on, uh, on stage. Uh, Sen Satya. So Sen Satya is the uh, the founder of and CT uh, and CEO, sorry, of uh, Luftcore. Uh, and so he's going to uh, present his company. Good morning, uh, California. Good afternoon, uh, Paris. Are you able to hear me? <laughs> yes. Uh, is it possible to uh, to share your presentation? Uh, yes, I'm going to do that right now, and right. Uh, let me uh, do this up here. Uh, let me let me see, uh, know if you're able to see my screen. Yes, I can see your screen perfectly. Okay, wonderful. Well, uh, first of all, I am the uh, founder and CEO of Lyft Car, and uh, I'm going to walk through our concept and why we are doing this uh, particular uh, disruptive uh, vehicle concept. At Lyft Car, um, well, uh, let me go back, go back to the need. Only 2% of us passengers choose air travel for distances less than 500 miles. Uh, this is largely because of uh, logistics issues, cost issues. So we prefer to use uh, road vehicles for that short distances so that we can have our freedom of travel. And also when we reach, uh, reach destinations, uh, we, we will end up renting uh, road vehicles if we don't have a, uh, if, if we uh, fly commercially. So it'd be great to have a vehicle that you can fly as well as drive. So we are coming up with this multimodal air and road vehicle concept. It's EV tall vehicle. Also, the current air taxis that we are talking about, which are 600 in number right now, uh, use uh, batteries. And batteries are limited in their energy density. Uh, we are going with hydrogen fuel cell powertrain. It's going to be a hydrogen fuel cell and battery powertrain, which is four times the energy density compared to, compared to that of batteries. So having said that, uh, let's go to our vision. Our vision is to develop these multimodal air and road vehicles, which would preserve your personal freedom in transportation and also deliver true last mile delivery, not only for cargo, but also for services like air ambulances, disaster relief, and also cargo for industrial and commercial and personal applications. Uh, this is our concept. There is a cool video on our website. Uh, if you have the time, uh, go to www.luftcar.com. There is a website, there is a video out there that you can see the con where the concept is demonstrated. Uh, the vehicle uh, would uh, take off up to 100 feet and then go up to 4,000 to 5,000 feet altitude as FAA or EASA recommend. And then they can travel up to 300 miles or 450 kilometers in air. And then they can land vertically and the road vehicle will detach and drive up to 150 miles. So you can drive the road vehicle like you will drive any electric vehicle. The air module is the one that's powered by hydrogen and battery uh, powertrain. And the road vehicle will be completely powered by battery. And uh, we are working with FAA and also with NASA, licensing a couple of key technologies from NASA. And uh, we are uh, working with some commercial airports on defining the concept of operations. Uh, to the market space here is that there are 600 EV tall vehicles already. It's a, it's, a, it's a growing business, a growing industry. But out of those 600, there are only five of them that have hydrogen powered EV tall vehicles uh, in aviation and in, in the vertical takeoff landing space. And out of that, out of those 600, only three are uh, multimodal. Uh, but out of those three, a lift car is the only one that has got the detaching version where you have the freedom to carry your road vehicle on the road without having to carry the whole flying contraption in, in, in the urban environment. So the IP is around the docking mechanism that we are developing. We will also be developing IPs around the hydrogen fuel cell powertrain. We are in line with uh, what's going on with the Department of Energy Initiatives in the United States. Uh, we are um, planning for this hydrogen uh, business model uh, based on the cost roadmap that the DOE has put out. When the, when the price of hydrogen per kilogram is going to be $2, by 2025, hopefully, we will be profitable. And uh, we are going to have our commercialization first in 2026. So we are in line for profitability in 2026 as we get in. And by 2030, it'll be $1 per kilogram for hydrogen. And uh, at the time, we will be generating nearly $500 billion of sales of hydrogen uh, universally. Um, 
and this would be uh, lift car and vehicles like lift car we are on we are in talks with airports we have already signed a few mous with with airports uh, we have signed mous with key fuel cell companies and battery companies and we are building up the uh, hydrogen consortiums we are participating in some of those hydrogen hub conversations across the united states this is our hydrogen um, lay, uh, hydrogen landing pad layout for these vehicles so these uh, lift pads or the verdi ports as we uh, as other people call them where will be where these vehicles will land and they will get refueled with hydrogen and also recharged with batteries for the road vehicle and the road vehicles will uh, detach and they would drive uh, into the uh, urban environment and they will come back attach and then fly up so the uh, verdi ports that we require um, the verdi ports in our case we will need around a uh, one verdi port every 50 miles radius unlike my competitors where you require a lot of tear down of infrastructure every few blocks to build verdi ports we need verdi ports every 50 miles radius uh, we are going to be again an autonomous vehicle which is going to have the depth perception uh, depth perception distance perception and also communications command and control uh, we have a great team uh, i myself uh, am one of the first people to develop hydrogen fuel cell cars for ford motor company in the united states i have also worked in uh, ge energy and also in boeing so i come from the energy automotive and aviation space that's why this vehicle uh, fits into that intersection of those industries and i have a great team of uh, engineers who have done uh, product development from great companies uh, who are supporting me in this effort i've got a great team of advisors who come from that ecosystem particularly from military us uh, department of energy and and other um, energy companies of some of our earliest markets would be the cargo delivery the last mile delivery like i said and also emergency relief disaster relief we got letter of interest from uh, one uh, very key uh, medical company uh, and cargo companies are interested in us they are all waiting for us to develop our first prototype uh, we are uh, going to be also a defense vehicle uh, in doing uh, ship to ship ship to shore doing land missions in contested zones so on and so forth we will disrupt the personal mobility space uh, with these vehicles uh, they can be personal vehicles they can also be uh, rented by airports uh where these vehicles can connect our uh, big cities with small uh, rural areas and give more aerial transportation to people democratizing travel uh this is a, a case in study for france we have similar maps for every region in the world uh with strategically uh, um uh, assigned air spaces we can cover pretty much much of uh, 90 to 95% of uh, france uh through uh lift car coverage Uh, and also the demand for hydrogen would be we would create a, a 34 34 billion dollars of uh, green hydrogen demand by 2030 which would be 34000 uh, tons of green hydrogen around 30 lift pads with each lift pad having 12 to 15 vehicles is what we are estimating to 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 sustain uh, uh, the the multimodal transportation across france uh, our market uh, business model is looks pretty robust uh, we are anticipating nearly 43 billion dollars 45 billion dollars of uh, market potential by end of 2030 as as we continue with our plans and as we participate in multiple different in industry segments and um, uh, like i said our, our true competition is not the uh, other ev tall vehicles our true competition are the cars or the trucks or the cargo industry uh, and also uh, the small commercial airplanes and uh, we are the only ones that have got the unique multimodal uh, concept and uh, we are targeting hydrogen fuel cell and that that would hydrogen fuel cell powertrain which would give us the 300 to 500 miles range we are right now working on a digital twin and we will have our first prototype ready by end of 2022 uh, we are currently in the seed stage and uh, we are uh, we will have our battery vehicle by 2024 and our hydrogen vehicle by 2025 uh, and during that time frame we will be going through certification at uh, FAA and also EASA and we will have uh, comm- we will be we'll, we'll target to commercialize by 2026 we are partnered with some great universities uh, we are also trying to license couple of technologies from NASA uh, we have been uh, award winner regional award winners from clean tech open we have also been awarded the best winning concept in aviation week in miami uh, end of last year and we are looking for a great year ahead thank you very much thank you thank you sen i'm uh, excited to see your uh, technology out there <laughs> uh, great so we're going to uh, to move on uh, with uh, with mark and uh, Mark is the uh, president and CEO of uh, H2U Technologies. Hi Mark. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me okay? 
Yes, perfectly. Um, can, can, can you share your screen or do you want uh, me to share it? Yeah, I think that uh, I was told that they were going to use this. You were going to use the slides that I sent. Yes, definitely. All right. I'm going to share it. And uh, for some reason, the camera settings not working, but uh, if you can hear me okay, that's uh, uh, essential. No problem. not working today is is there any way you could uh, share your screen or not uh i i don't have the deck uh with me right here i have to would have to um let's see here yeah unfortunately the deck is is not working here um i will i will see what i can do and i will uh, uh make... well i'll tell you what um i will just use uh an alternate uh an alternate deck, I should be able to share that. Uh, let's see here. So can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Yes, perfect. Can you see it now? Yes. Sorry okay. for this uh, technical issue. You got it. Yeah, perfect. It, is it is it okay now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. Uh, I'll be. Uh, I'll get right into it. H uh, two Technologies is a company that was formed on the basis of Caltech intellectual property that was funded by DOE work, Department of Energy work, for about ten years and about one hundred and twenty million dollars worth of. Uh, uh, development uh, at Caltech. H2U now owns that patent and intellectual property library um, exclusively and in perpetuity uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, and the two areas that we're focused on at H2U Technologies is the development of catalysts that can replace expensive and rare uh, iridium and platinum that are currently used in electrolyzers to produce green hydrogen. And uh, secondly, we are developing a novel uh, PEM electrolyzer design that uses those non-PGM catalysts. So the uh, current standard uh, of electrolyzer technology, as you probably know, <clears throat> uses very expensive PGM or platinum group metal catalysts, uh, iridium and uh, platinum. And you may know that iridium uh, exists on the planet only because of, of an asteroid strike billions of years ago, the same one that wiped out the dinosaurs. Uh, so unless we have another asteroid strike, which would present a different problem, uh, we're not going to have enough iridium by anyone's uh, reckoning uh, to fuel a hydrogen, a global hydrogen economy. H2U solves that problem. We are offering uh, and developing and uh, optimizing uh, alternatives to iridium and platinum and the HER and OER sides of the catalyst reactions uh, th that uh, occur when you're producing hydrogen with PEM electrolyzers. So we have uh, what we call a catalyst discovery engine um, and there isn't time to go into that but it's the world's fastest by several orders of magnitude uh, fastest way to discover uh, alternative catalysts for many applications, but our focus is uh, on hydrogen uh, electrolyzer catalysts. And that's where we uh, are producing and have partnerships for some uh, game-changing catalysts that solve the uh, iridium problem. And, and also to a second uh, point, the platinum uh, uh, issue. So uh, <clears throat> the market's very large. Uh, I think this group uh, doesn't need to see too much of that. This is, by the way, is a longer presentation, so I won't uh, try to cover everything here. Um, but the uh, development strategy at uh, HCU is twofold. We have the catalyst that we are uh, putting into membrane electrode assemblies and CCMs um, that will demonstrate the efficacy of the and the durability of these catalysts. Uh, but then we can take those designs. Uh, those materials, sorry, and 
offer them in alternate electrolyzer designs. If you think about legacy PEM electrolyzer designs that are based on precious metals that are literally more expensive than gold, <clears throat> you have to be very careful about how you design the uh, stacks and the MEAs that use these precious metals. Um, but if you have um, catalyst materials that are one ten thousandths as expensive as iridium, um, you can uh, apply uh, manufacturing designs and practices um, that are quite different. So as opposed to maybe like a jeweler that needs to be very careful with the way they use the gold, or in this case, platinum and iridium, um, it can be more like a electrode manufacturer uh, using something as cheap as a carbon slurry. So that's a, a key uh, value prop that HCU brings to the market. Um, we are unique in the ability to uh, deliver alternative uh, catalyst designs uh, and materials and also the electrolyzer that is a work in progress that we're designing to uh, uh, use this uh, low cost uh, <clears throat> catalyst material. Uh, there are other players in this space. Uh, this is where we stand relative to the competition on upgrade flexibility as well as initial capex. Um, <clears throat> I won't try to cover, sorry about this because uh, um, you don't have the, the eight page version. I'm going to skip a number of slides here, but suffice it to say that uh, <clears throat> we've got a very strong team, <clears throat> excuse me, as you can see here. Um, and uh, we have just recently uh, completed a very successful oversubscribed series A, uh, and we will be uh, going to the market. We're looking for uh, companies that are interested in uh, demonstrating these types of uh, technologies uh, and in particular demonstrating the efficacy of our electrolyzers from uh, roughly 100 to 200 kilowatt uh, in size. Uh, we have a, a current uh, partnership with Southern Cal Gas, the largest gas company in America. Um, that is demonstrating uh, our new electrolyzer design and we're looking for more partnerships like that so with that uh, uh I'll, I'll give it back to uh, your team and um be happy to answer any questions later thank you great thank you thank you so much mark uh sorry for the the little problems i think the the platform is not allowing the uh the the presentations we had uh in in stuff but thank you thank you so much uh, great, great presentation. Uh, great. So we're going to uh, to move on with uh, Chad Mason. Uh, so while we wait for uh, for Chad, uh, so Chad is the uh, the founder and CEO of uh, Advanced Unix. Uh, so he's going to uh, present his uh, company in a, in a few seconds. Here and see me, okay? Yes. How are you doing? Not too bad. Okay, great. I'll share the uh, presentation here. Yes, please. Thank you. The uh, the the tool is uh, being difficult today. <laughs> yeah, let's hope my internet behaves. Um, <laughs> well, uh, well, thanks for for inviting me, and really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to go to full screen. Does does this show up? Okay. Yes, perfectly. Awesome, and let me know if it doesn't transition. So I'm oh, Chad Mason. Transition. Sorry, it's not on full screen yet. Oh, uh, okay. Um, I'm. This happens sometimes. All right. Does it uh, show up yet on full screen? Mm, no. We, we can see your uh, your uh, your screen though. Okay. No worries. We'll just uh, I'll just keep it in regular um, mode here. Um, all right, so um, I'm Chad Mason, uh, founder and CEO of Advanced Ionics. Um, and uh, like some of the other folks on the line here, uh, we're developing green hydrogen without the green premium. Um, so we're a Milwaukee, Wisconsin based company, and we're developing a new generation of electrolyzers uh, for the lowest cost zero carbon green hydrogen specifically for heavy industry. And so, you know, depending on the geography and the country and the consumer, um, there's a lot of concerns around the use of gray hydrogen. In the U.S., uh, companies are generally focused on the price uh, of natural gas. Um, places such as Europe are a little bit more focused about regulation. 
Um, and then depending on who you're talking to, there's le delivery logistics, customers want green products, so on and so forth. So it's interesting, you know, why hasn't the issue of uh, electrolysis been solved? They've been available for quite some time. And the problem is they were never cost effective. So they never became dominant for industrial use. And a lot of that really just has to do with OPEX. Um, despite everyone talking about CAPEX for electrolysis, um, at the end of the day, electrolyzers are driven by OPEX. So the price of your electricity um, and how much electricity you use. So let's use less of it and let's uh, make cheaper hydrogen. And so our systems consume between 20 to 50 percent less electricity than the systems that are available now uh, by utilizing low grade waste or process heat. Um, and that enables us to achieve costs uh, that we project will be well below a dollar per kilogram. And so, you know, these are the industries we're really looking at serving here. And so, you know, when you look at a few examples of, you know, what are the biggest, um, you know, hydrogen consuming processes that exist or ones with synergy, um, you look at Fischer-Tropsch, methanol, Haber-Bosch for ammonia, and then in refineries, desulfurization, hydrocracking, hydrogenation, and then up and coming steel market. They all operate in this range of temperatures. Um, and then we've built our technology to work at these industrial temperatures and enable that low electricity use. So as far as we know, we'll be the first to the market with this type of electrolyzer that operates in this sweet spot. And we do that simply by using that process heat that's available. I know um, someone else that was earlier um, talking about um, the availability of steam on site. And that's exactly what we're doing is, is using that process heat and that, that dry steam that comes from these processes. Um, and we're designing these to be easily integrated without, with minimal changes or disruptions to the facility. So a simplified balance of plant. And comparing ourselves to alkaline, AEM, PAM, solid oxide, basically, uh, we combine the best of both worlds, the, the low costs of alkaline with the OPEX advantages of solid oxide. And so we think we'll be the ones to break the dollar per kilogram barrier the fastest. A little bit about our, our roadmap here. We, we kind of name things internally based on the NASA space mission. So we're working on the Mercury uh, stacks and cells right now. Uh, most of our optimization occurs on, you know, smaller test cells. Um, and then we'll be looking at um, sending out these prototype Gemini stacks to select partners um, in late 23 and 24. Um, and those will be probably the first units to be commercialized, um, followed by development of uh, something that's much, much larger. <clears throat> um, similarly, on the power supply side, we have a great relationship with a company that does high efficiency uh, power supplies for a tier one uh, battery manufacturer. Um, and so we'll be levering, leveraging those synergies with, uh, with them and our systems. So it doesn't make sense to use a, a bad power supply um, or 90% efficient rectifier with the most efficient electrolyzer. <clears throat> uh, so a little bit about location, just to get some of you thinking is we're really targeting these, these industries and places where there's synergies, industrial clusters, valley, valleys, um, so we really look at, you know, a Venn diagram of what are the ideal end uses, um, where is there policies that are supportive. Um, the EU is really a leader there, um, and France has, of course, done a lot. And then, you know, locations where um, there's favorable dynamics at play, low electricity prices, um, abundant clean energy, nuclear renewables, um, things like that. Um, we are not focusing on, on cars, heating, transportation. Um, it's not our focus area. We have a really great team of people here, and I wish I could uh, list everybody. Um, we're growing to about 16 people by the end of this year. Um, we've received investment from Clean Energy Ventures um, and Swan out of uh, Texas and an EU energy company that we haven't. Um, so we haven't done a public announcement yet on the funding round. So uh, be on the lookout for press releases for us from us in early April. Um, Series A will do in early 23. So if you're interested in uh, being a strategic investor, please reach out. Um, or if you're just someone who has deep domain knowledge and wants to uh, work with us, uh, please let us know. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chad. It was, it was a great presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Uh, great, so we are moving on uh, with uh, Bart. Um, so Bart Norton is the, uh, the chairman at uh, Contact. Um, so we're just going to uh, wait for him and he's going to uh, present his comment. Hi, Bart, how are you doing? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. And uh, it's not allowing me to share the camera for some reason. Some 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 issues today with uh, with the live live storm platform. Okay. Uh, so, uh, are you able to uh, to share your screen? I don't see. Uh, uh, what do I, what should I be seeing to share the screen in terms? Of uh, so at the at the bottom of the page. Uh, oh, I see. Uh, share very well. Yes. Uh, and and share your screen. Okay. Uh... Oh. Okay. This could be done a lot better. Uh, you have my presentation. Are you having trouble sharing it? Yeah, that's that's the problem. We uh, we had all the presentations, but the the. Okay, it's up on my screen in PowerPoint. I don't see how to get to it though. Um, so yeah, from the Livestone platform, you have a share button at the uh, the bottom of the the, the platform, and you can uh, share a screen. I'll go. I'll try clicking that again. That's all. Sure. Okay, it gives me share a video, but that's not a video. It's a PowerPoint presentation. Um, yeah, there's there's a little button share screen. Oh, okay. All right, there it is. Yeah, sorry for that. Okay. Sorry, everyone, a little issues. Uh, it's uh, it's not allowing me to press the allow button. This is really bad. <laughs> It's just showing that it's trying to block it. Select window. Okay, wait, wait a second. Uh, this is looking good. All right. Do you have the presentation? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly and I can see your screen. Okay, very well. Um, my name is Bart Norton. I'm the founder and the board chair of Contact Hydrogen Storage. Um, okay, now how do I change the slides? This is very frustrating. Um, yes, okay. um, you, you have to go to your PowerPoint. Okay, so go to PowerPoint itself. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my, my. Okay. All right. Are you seeing the slides change? Yes. Very well. Um, we're a hydrogen technology company. We've been in business for uh, since 2016. Uh, we're pioneers in hydrogen on a liquid ammonia, which we're calling HOLA. Uh, we have the highest hydrogen storage capacity. We accept all colors of hydrogen. We're the lowest cost hydrogen solution end to end, and we're being acquired by Hydrofuel of Canada. Uh, of course, everybody's familiar with the problems of hydrogen. How do you produce enough economical green hydrogen at scale? How do you store and distribute it? How do you build the infrastructure? 
uh, uses for hydrogen and stationary or transportation use, the old chicken and egg problem. And then how do you recycle at the end of life? We have come up with something we call zero cycle. Uh, we produce the uh, raw materials from uh, uh, electrolysis. We produce green ammonia and turn it into green uh, hydrogen. Uh, we store and distribute 17.3% hydrogen weight by weight. can be utilized in fuel cells or compression ignition engines. And at the end of life, uh, once we've separated out the hydrogen, we just release the nitrogen back into the atmosphere. The advantages of ammonia are clear. 17.3% weight by weight hydrogen storage capacity, which is three times compressed or 43 times larger than liquid hydrogen. Uh, low pressure or a modest amount of cooling keeps the ammonia liquid. And we patented something we call the hydrogen release module. It's shown here, the, the key element is a 3D printed uh, catalytic coated <clears throat> reactor core, which is uh, heated inductively. <clears throat> I'm sorry, the, the liquid enters at the lower left is diffused uh, is vaporized and heated to almost the proper temperature. And then the uh, catalytic uh, core uh, releases the hydrogen from the nitrogen. The nitrogen is vented to the atmosphere and the hydrogen is passed along to the application. Uh, I've given a quick example. There, of course, are many that we could use. Uh, on a 500 mile heavy duty truck, this would be a class eight vehicle. It takes two kilowatt hours to go a mile. So to go 500 miles requires a full megawatt hour of power. That's 14 Tesla batteries weighing over 7,600 kilograms. Our solution by comparison weighs less than 2,000 kilograms for a net weight savings of 5,600 kilograms. And that, of course, all goes to the bottom line for the truckers. These long haul trucks are not they're basically traveling full to a destination. A fueling time of eight minutes versus 30 for only 80% capacity is also another advantage. In that eight minutes, we refuel to a full 100% of capacity. We had to develop something to cover the last light, uh, mile. Ammonia has a dis distribution infrastructure that's already in place. We just have to get it to the vehicles or the application. So we've developed on a 20 foot shipping container, a fueling station that has twice the capacity, 20% of the cost of compressed stations because the release of the hydrogen is done on board the vehicle with our uh, hydrogen release module can be installed or moved in a day. We have models on the drawing board that would allow electric vehicle charging completely off the grid. It would have the no connections to anything, and these could be set anywhere. And this is all patent pending. We've had first office action and expect the patent soon. Of course, we have the trillion dollar market for electric aircraft. Everybody is looking for an alternative to batteries. We would allow twice the payload, twice the range, and refueling in 20% of the time. Uh, a, a real breakthrough in what we're trying to do. And we'd be glad to talk to anybody about these various things. Hydrofuels uh, information is on the left. My information is on the right. I invite you to call or email, and I'd be glad to have a discussion with you. We have something that's very unique, and I'd love to talk about it. And of course, our lawyers ask us to do this. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, we made it work. Uh, so thank you, thank you. Uh, great. So uh, last presentation for uh, today, uh, Mac. Uh, so I'm going to invite Mac. I believe this report helped us, and we have the presentation. Uh, we have the presentation now. So um, so Mac Kennedy is the co-founder and CEO of uh, Moat. Uh, and so he is going to be able to uh, to present uh, directly on the screen. Hello, Mac. Thank you so much, Flo. Uh, 
to address the elephant in the room, I, I do have a broken nose right now. So uh, <laughs> I apologize for the unsightly appearance, but uh, I think we'll be able to get through this, uh, this presentation. Um, awesome. So um, I guess you have my, my presentation. Yes, it's, it's on the screen already. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for having me. My name is Matt Kennedy. I'm the CEO of Moat. Um, we take wood waste and gasify it into hydrogen um, and then send the CO2 to um, geologic storage. Um, so we started the company in March of 2020 and are really excited about what we're, we're doing right now. So um, uh, next slide, please. So our, our team is, is really um, exciting. We're hiring for seven roles right now. So uh, excited to fit this presentation in, in between a bunch of on-site interviews we have today. Um, uh, I started the business with my co-founder, Josh Stolaroff. Um, he started and led the carbon capture program at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Um, and before that, uh, he helped start the, uh, the, the work behind carbon engineering and, and doing the direct air capture company there. And um, so our, our business is based on Josh's work at Lawrence Livermore, where they looked at kind of all the different proven carbon removal pathways uh, for the state of California. And it turns out that taking wood waste and doing gasification to hydrogen with CCS um, had the greatest scalability. And so that was kind of the, the origin of our, our business. And um, we have... Uh, decades of experience on our team uh, of buying millions of tons of uh, woody feedstocks in California's Central Valley, where we're going to uh, build our first projects um, and then across global markets as well. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm sure many people will be familiar with this uh, basic diagram, which our logo is actually based on. Um, but right now we need to you know, drastically reduce uh, emissions and then also have a brand new industry that's equivalent to the size of the existing oil and gas industry that's dedicated to removing CO2 from the atmosphere. So there's two problems, you know, decarbonizing and then actually doing negative emissions. And we have a scalable approach for, for both of those problems. Next slide, please. So this is a very simplified process flow diagram of what we're doing. Um, like I mentioned, we're building out the first project in California's Central Valley. There's abundant CO2 storage there that's under development. Um, there's a robust market for woody feedstocks, um, and uh, it's in close proximity to the LA basin in, in Los Angeles, where there's an exciting uh, burgeoning renewable hydrogen market. Um, so what we do as a business is create system integration technologies to put proven pieces of equipment together in a novel process flow. And the, the markets for renewable hydrogen and carbon removal both make this now possible. Next slide, please. So there's two revenue streams mainly for our business. Um, so selling the hydrogen initially as a transportation fuel, um, and then also selling the carbon removal um, uh, through the compliance market, getting the, uh, the tax credit at the federal level in the United States, um, and then through the California low carbon fuel standard credit marketplace. Next slide, please. So ultimately, the, the markets for renewable hydrogen and carbon removal are both going to be trillion dollar markets. And we're obviously in the very, you know, maybe not even in the first inning yet. And um, so the potential for, for both of these is, is really exciting. Uh, carbon removal is a little more mature, surprisingly, right now. Uh, but um, we're going to be able to help jumpstart this renewable hydrogen market. Uh, next slide. So um, what we do as a company, as I mentioned, is create these system integration technologies for putting the entire system together, since there's a lot of foundational questions in terms of how you connect uh, the gasifier to the downstream equipment and solve these kind of um, problems that, that haven't been solved before because of, of this being a novel process flow. So we've been developing that now uh, with our partners. Um, and also we, we plan to uh, operate our projects um, and, and further deploy our technology through operations um, and develop technology there. And then we also have a proprietary model for how we're actually citing projects uh, where there's the confluence of uh, woody biomass, CO2 storage, and renewable hydrogen markets, uh, which is rapidly expanding right now. Um, next slide. So this kind of gives a flavor to how what we're doing compares to water electrolysis to make hydrogen. So ultimately, our production cost curve is very similar to water electrolysis, but most of the value of what we're doing comes from carbon removal. And, and so that's what gives us a really long-term uh, ability to compete with water electrolysis because um, most of the value comes from our, our very low cost per, per ton of CO2 
removed. Um, and our, you know, the carbon intensity of our hydrogen is roughly negative 150 grams of CO2 per megajoule compared to, you know, doing water electrolysis, which in the best case scenario is about emitting 10 grams of CO2 per megajoule. Next slide, please. So um, our plan is to integrate. We're initially doing the midstream to deliver the hydrogen to our customers. Um, and eventually we plan to build our own hydrogen refueling stations, which right now is super uh, prohibitive to do in terms of the, the cost. So uh, that's that's a little more down the line, but um, integrating this, this uh, value chain is, is really um, interesting in terms of our strategy. Next slide. So the, the way our business model works is we integrate our technology into large projects. So, you know, we provide support in terms of operations, um, help in the development and the siting. And um, so we're a minority owner of the projects and, and, and uh, operate them. And um, so we're working with a couple of different companies right now, looking at what our first project is going to be in California's Central Valley. But this model will help us really scale quickly and work with uh, partners across the globe. And the economics of our projects are, are really um, attractive. Next slide, please. So um, I mentioned we have sites that, that we're ready to, to move on in the um, California Central Valley. Um, CO2 storage is already underway in permitting. And um, we are uh, a really interesting mix uh, for regulators because we solve a couple of different problems for them in terms of solving the uh, biomass waste issue, uh, the renewable hydrogen issue, and the, the carbon capture issue and, and not emitting air pollution. So it, it checks a lot of boxes for regulators and, and they're super excited to support us. Um, and the equipment that we're using exists in the real world today and we have decades of operating data that, that shows it works. So that's kind of core to our strategy of deploying rapidly and, and scaling. Next slide. So um, we're working with uh, Floor Corporation right now on um, a, a pre-feed and we're getting ready to start the feed on our first project, which we're looking forward to announcing. Um, and we're working with Gas Technology Institute to use their gasifier. And we um, aspire to utilize as much of our CO2 as possible in addition to the geologic storage uh, through companies like Carbon Cure. Next slide. So we just closed a seed round um, in Q4 of last year, and we are going to open up a Series A in April to uh, solidify our technology platform and to service this pipeline of about five projects we have right now. Um, so the, the Series A is for the capital light part of our business, and the EPC phase on any of these projects is enabled by project finance. Next slide. Awesome. That's Moat. And uh, thank you so much, Flo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank. Uh, see you later. Uh, great. Thank you so much uh, to all the presenters. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for uh, coming by. And uh, I will uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.